Uh, hey, so I, I want to do, uh, I'm doing chapter four of James today. I've loved this series as we've been going through it, looking at James from a super practical perspective of how James is drawing us to a place of letting fresh life um, in the spirit into our hearts, learning places that we have to address. Sometimes it's a little hard, uh, attitudes we need to adjust, uh, how our tongue works and things that we say, where we find wisdom and how we, uh, we access that. But, um, but we're going to talk today about, a, about another topic that, that caused me in thinking about this to, uh, to look to a totally different author other than James. And I was thinking about Charles Dickens. Everybody know who Charles Dickens is? He wrote A Christmas Carol. Uh, anybody ever seen that? Yeah, I said seen it because, and rather than read it because you're more likely to see it than read it because it's a long book. And uh, he, he's an interesting writer. Uh, most of us would know him for A Christmas Carol. However, his most famous piece and one of the best-selling books of all times, does anybody know what it's called? There it is, A Tale of Two Cities. I heard it right here, A Tale of Two Cities. A Tale of Two Cities starts out with a line that, um, a, a line, a sentence, a, a sentence. It's almost a paragraph, but it's only one sentence. It's one of the longest sentences I've ever seen in print that uh, the Apostle Paul didn't write. Uh, but it, it starts out with a sentence that, that you've heard quoted, and uh, it's, it's long. Uh, it, it says this, it says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity, it was the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. It goes on and on and on. And I've got to ask the question, what was it? Was it the best of times or was it the worst of times? I mean, was it, was it foolishness or was it wisdom? And I'll tell you what it is. And here's what this sentence is all about and why I'm bringing this into this teaching today. This sentence brings up a paradox. Every time, every time Dickens wrote something, he, uh, he wrote on the basis of examining paradoxes that were happening in society that ultimately were going to bring about the demise of that society if something didn't change. This was one of his few historical pieces that he wrote about the French Revolution. And, um, and a paradox is something where one comment will seemingly contradict the next comment that's coming its way, but when you investigate further, both of them can be true going side by side. So in this book, he's dealing with issues of what's happening in society over here with the best of times as war is about to break out here in the worst of times. What's happening here in the joy that people experience in light while all of a sudden we're seeing the darkness that's taking place in this setting. Paradoxes are everywhere. We find paradoxes in our society uh, all the time. As believers, we live in a social paradox because of the fact we recognize that, that we have been given functional societal norms to live by in God's word. That's what we've been examining as we've been going through the book of James. But throughout the entirety of scripture, you find ways that if, if humankind would learn to live according to what God's word says and let the spirit of God breathe that kind of life into them, that you would find that the crises that we face in the midst of our world would just fall aside. And you might say, well, gosh, that sounds kind of uh, shallow and singularly focused that all the answers could be in one book. God created the world. He certainly knows how it's supposed to run. He, he designed you and me. He certainly knows what would make us work. And so the paradox that we're in the midst of is we live in a world that doesn't recognize that the truth is right before them. And part of the problem is, and this is where James addresses things, that there's things in our own lives that we don't live out the way we ought to. And so he starts addressing these issues, the, the forces that start to, uh, to press against us. And in James chapter 4, we're going to look at a great paradox that exists in this chapter, and we're going to call it the paradox of humility. Say that with me, the paradox of humility. So humility, uh, on one hand, it can be described as a modest view of one's own importance or recognition of the values of others. In other words, I would be, I could, 
uh, in the midst, in a, in a setting that you're in, you could either force your way in the midst of that setting, or you could humbly say, let me hear what everybody else might be adding to the picture. That, that's a very simple picture of humility. But let me give you maybe even a, a, a more simple and yet um, more in-depth de- definition. It's this, freedom from pride or arrogance. Freedom from pride or arrogance. So our goal today is to see us all set free from pride and arrogance. And I just have to ask, does any of that ever sneak into anybody's life? You know, it, okay, the eight of us, we'll meet in the corner and have a, have a conversation. The rest of you humble people, you can go to lunch now. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's an issue that, that most of humanity deals with. Why? Because everything in the world deals with that. We, we, we're we're concerned with what other people think about us. We're concerned with how we, how we present ourselves in our workplaces. We want everyone to know that we can do it, that, that whole control issue. You talked about control just a little bit ago, uh, Krista, and it's like those kinds of things get in our way. And so I was thinking, what's the best way to teach about humility? And I thought the best way to teach about humility is if I were to master it. So I am, I am proud to brag today that I am the most humble person in the room, <laughs> which, of course, isn't true. Um, and uh, though, though we're working towards that, that is far from true. Uh, but one of the incredible things about humility that makes it a paradox is this. Humility is something that you must decide to live in, but someone else needs to identify it in your life. Think about that for a minute. It's one of those areas, you know, if, if, you, if you want to learn how to play the piano, you take piano lessons, you practice, you get good at playing the piano, and you know, you can say, I can play the piano really well. And that's okay. That's, that's all right to say. But, but if you want to get, become a humble person and you say, I'm going to work really hard at, at uh, being humble, and then you tell people, I've really got this humility thing down, it contradicts itself. Humility is something that you and I work toward but that other people have to see in our lives and identify. So in other words, I can't say, yeah, I'm, I'm really humble. But, but you could identify points of humility in people. That, how many would say you know a person that's a really, a really humble person, that when you talk to me, you go, man, that, that person is humble. It's an interesting thing. I, I don't see pride or arrogance in that person at all. I know numbers of people like that. Now, let, me, let me give you a humorous scripture about humility for a moment. It's in Numbers chapter 12. Um, it's about Moses and, uh, and uh, Miriam and, uh, and Aaron, brother and sister, are, are talking and they go, uh, has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? And then there's this parenthetical statement. It says, now Moses was more humble. Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on the earth. Now that's awesome. Can you imagine having the Bible say that about you? I mean, that's pretty cool when the Bible would say something like that about you. That could be Moses' business card. Moses, more humble than any other person on earth. You know, that could be what's printed on his business card. But what's peculiar about this is that Moses wrote that book. <laughs> so I have always kind of wondered if that might have been like some scribe that was trans, translating the book or, or moving it from one scroll to the other finally kind of got in and defended Moses as, as Miriam and Aaron are, are saying the things they're saying and say, by the way, Moses was more humble than anyone else on the, I don't know, but well, it's on my list of things to ask when I get to heaven. I just hope I don't forget that list uh, on the way, but um, so let's look at our text. It's interesting that in chapter four of James, and if you take your Bible or your phone or whatever device you're using to open to James, we'll put it up here, but wouldn't be bad to have it so you can highlight some verses here and there. Um, chapter four of James happens to come right after <laughs> chapter three, uh, but we're talking about humility right after talking about wisdom. And I don't think that's an accident because I think when you start to look at those pieces, they are not disconnected. In fact, the source of true wisdom is realized when we get the, uh, the tools to live in humility or having true wisdom gives us those tools 
to live in humility. It's an important part of the whole puzzle. And the first 10 uh, verses of this chapter are so important. And we're going to go through the entirety of the chapter because I'll show you some pieces that uh, exist. The entire chapter is about humility, even though it doesn't all uh, say it all the way along. But the first 10 pieces are so important. They teach us that selfish desires are the source of all human conflict. You find that as you read through those first 10 verses of the book. Selfish desires are the source of all human conflict. You agree? Think about this. I don't think there's ever been a war that hasn't ultimately resulted uh, from some type of selfish desire that's happening. You look at what's happening in Ukraine right now. That, was a, that is a selfish desire that has taken place that's caused an entire nation, a people group, uh, millions and millions of refugees, people's lives are being lost because of selfish desires. Every war exists for that way or the misunderstanding that comes as a result of selfish desires after that conflict happens as a result of selfish desires. And this, uh, this early part of this uh, chapter is talking to us about that. And it's an interesting conflict concept because conflict is all around us. Does conflict control you? Does conflict feed you? Or do you feed it? Or do you find ways to deal with it? And this passage of scripture has more to do than ju with just finding the answer to living as a humble person. It has to do with readdressing how everything in our life, our worldview and our perspectives actually work. So in a world filled with conflict, we have an answer to conflict that comes to us in the scriptures. The scriptures show us how to deal with it, shows us how to bypass it, shows us how to give no place to conflict. And James indicates that peace comes through, listen to this, quiet submission to God. Say that with me, quiet submission to God. You might say, gosh, pastor, that sounds so simple. Submission is not always a simple thing, but that's the answer here. And we'll see that in, in a moment in verse 10. Let me read some of this to you. Uh, what's causing the quarrels and fights among you? Do they come from, they come, don't they come from evil desires at war within you? You want to do what you, um, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight, you wage war, and you take it away from them. Yet don't they, um, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong and you want only what gives you pleasure. So he's addressing the concept of a mindset of how they're going about things and the war that struggles within. And by the way, I, I, I feel like I didn't do this in the last service, but I want to jump back to the first verse. If you'd go back one slide, what's causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Let me just ask a question. Have you ever known of a person that is, that is a conflict causer. And when you stop to think, that person not only causes conflict every place they go, but conflict exists inside of them. We need to stop and think, when we're in the midst of conflict in lots of places, we have to stop and ask, Lord, is there conflict inside of me? Am I not dealing with things right? Am I being the, the difficulty on this? Let's go on to... Uh, uh, verse 3, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate and that the spirit has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. And as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but here it is. He gives grace to the humble. So here's the first picture of humility in this chapter. As James is talking about the conflict that people have where they say they want to follow God, but then they fall in love with the world. And that's where he uses the term adulterer, which is such an interesting uh, statement to be used there because I don't think that's being used in the literal sense of sexual adultery uh, as we think about it, but it's being used on the fact of your heart is being torn two ways. Do you truly love God or do you truly love the things of the world around us? So it's a, it's a harsh word, but he jumps in. And then it says that uh, it identifies pride 
as humility's antithesis. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride and humility cannot live together. They are in opposition to each other. They, they can't live together. Tell somebody next to you, say, pride and humility can't live together. But here's the beautiful picture. God resists one and he gives his grace to the other. So when we're looking for the grace of God, it comes to the humble. But we already know we can't strive for humility. So the picture that we see here is if we put aside pride, then grace starts to come our way. Oh, now that I can start to do, right? We start to identify the places where pride exists and we can put that aside. When you choose humility as your goal, God will pour grace on your life and then we seek to resist the evil desires that bring up conflict in our lives and everything starts to work better because the grace of God uh, begins to work through us. It seems simple enough, but it's hard. And here's where the paradox comes into that because it seems that we have the ability to do things that might pursue humility and resist pride, but the answer is not to do things that will produce humility. The answer is to pursue something that will make you less prideful. So how do I pursue something that makes me less prideful? Because everything in a world says, well, you want to sell yourself in your working community, you've got to continue to better yourself. You got to, I, I'm okay with all those things, except when it comes to the point that it's our identity and it becomes places of pride. So, so here's the answer. When we, the interesting paradox is striving to succeed in something that we can't tell anyone that we're trying to succeed in, they have to see it for themselves. So what we need to do is look for ways to start getting rid of pride. I remember one time my, my father-in-law used to tell the story. Someone that had talked to him about um, an issue once, they said, gosh, pastor, he is pastor here too, and said, uh, gosh, gosh, pastor, when you say that, I think you might injure people's pride by saying the things that you said. Because he was asking people to do something, you know, like, like what Chris just said earlier about let's lift our voices. And the person came up, it was actually that issue, and the person came up and said, gosh, when you tell people they need to lift their voices, that might injure their pride. And he said, you know, that, that's, man, I really don't want to injure anybody's pride. He goes, I just want to kill it all together. <laughs> you know, because if, if, we, if we would just put our pride to death, then we'd start to recognize that we're living according to more of the humility that God desires inside of us. So look at how this happen, happens. Uh, it says, verse 7, humble yourselves before God. But here's the key to this. Submit and humble are the same word in this. There's two different words in this, in this uh, chapter that are translated as humble. Uh, the first one, which we dealt with, God gives grace to the humble. That is, God gives grace to those that, uh, that, um, have, that will allow others uh, to elevate in position and not have to fight for their position. That's that lowly uh, position of themselves. But it says, this one here, verse... Uh, Seven, it's actually using the same word as submit. So where it says God gives grace to the humble, and then it says humble yourself, he's saying submit yourself to God. So place yourself, submit is a word that means to place yourself under the authority of another. By the way, where the world mistakes, uh, makes the mistake in the word submit is they believe the word submit means to be conquered by something. Biblical submission does not have to do with being conquered. That, by the way, is not the word submission. That's the word subjugation. Uh, biblical submission has to do with coming to a place that you willfully place yourself under another person's authority. And uh, in, in doing that, that's the definition in this passage. Not being conquered, but a decisive action on your part to place yourself under authority. So when it says that you're in that position under God's authority, then you can resist the devil and he will flee to you. So submit to God and resist the devil. And what's the devil gonna do? He's gonna flee from you. So if the devil is the one that places pride in our lives and we resist his actions, then pride has no place 
to have an anchor inside of our lives. And when pride has no anchor inside of our lives because God resists the proud, then we don't have to worry about God resisting us, but now we can get to the place of God giving grace to those who are humble. And then it says, come close to God and God will draw close to you. Proximity, relationship, closeness with God defeats the plans of the devil in your life. When you draw close to God, he draws close to you. And I think that is so awesome because now it's not like I've got to work to be so great that God wants me around because God's not looking for you to be so great he wants you around. In fact, he saved us all while we were in a broken state. What he's looking for is for you to place yourself under his authority and say, Lord, what would you have for my life? What would you desire me to do? What would you like to see me do today or tomorrow or this year or with my life? That, that by the way, may be a question to ask yourself before you go to work tomorrow or school or whatever tomorrow holds for you to say, Lord, What would you like to do with my life? I I want to put myself in your hands today as you do this. And so life humbly submitted to God's plan, it leaves very little room for the enemy to have work in your life. Scripture goes on, it says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts for your loyalties divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. He's saying, don't let there be this mixture of, of striving and struggling and pride and arrogance. He said, wash yourself of that. Turn away from that which is sin. He said, and just start, start uh, um, let, let there be sadness over that brokenness of what's happened. And, and then he says this, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. In fact, read that with me. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Here's the key. You humble yourself before the Lord and he, had, he adds the honor to your life. But if you strive to receive the honor on your own, say, I want to get what's due to me, then you won't because that action originates out of a lack of humility. And the key to humility is submission. Let's walk away from pride and arrogance. Let's learn to resist those places where the enemy presses into us. Let's let's recognize if we want to see this particular uh, attribute developed inside of our life of humility, that the way to do it is not striving for humility, but walking away from the temptations the enemy would place in our life for pride and arrogance. True humility happens as we step into true submission to the Lord. It is surrender to the will of God. So, let me just give us, because one of the things that always helps me is having a couple of, of markers or, or ways to, to know whether or not something is existing in my life, kind of a, a, a way to, to a, a test or a metric that would uh, become a measuring point. And so I want to give you two points that are found in the rest of this passage now that are measurements of humility. The first is this, verse 11 and 12 show us that our humility can be measured by our attitude toward others, your attitude toward others. It says, don't, spend, uh, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? So here's an interesting thing. Any attitude that shows disdain or discredits another person reflects arrogance and pride in a person's life. And remember that that's the opposite of humility. So right here, kind of a measurement of how we're doing on the humility scale, if I can say that, comes down to how do we view other people? Are we better than every other person we meet? Uh, have, have you ever thought, even if there's people that, that think differently than you, that there might be areas that there would be things that you and I could learn from them? Have you ever, have you ever looked at, uh, at places and said, Lord, how do I relate to this person that is, is so different from everything that I believe or think in a way that I can end up being life in the midst of that person? We're in the same place. We're called to live under God's standards, God's world, God's children. Therefore, we don't really ever have a right to exercise superiority over any other person, particularly 
when the Bible is using the term neighbor. It says, don't judge your neighbor. And here's the interesting thing. As the Bible says things about how we deal with our neighbors, it says we're to love them. We're to care for them. We're, we're, to, we're to show concern for them. We're to pray for them. And it doesn't ever say in the Bible, go judge them. So that's an area that if we're going to walk according to God's ways, then we got to separate ourselves from that. And the way we view other people ends up becoming a, a metric to measure where humility is in our life. To what degree are we advancing in, in that? Because, or what degree are we diminishing our pride? Because by the way, judgment of other people comes from pride and arrogance. And, uh, and I will confess to you today, that will pop its head up in my life from time to time. And I don't know if I'm the only one here, but there are times where I have to stop and think, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. It wasn't right. It wasn't necessary. And it didn't come out of a humble heart. And that's in dealing with people. So, so this, is, this is part of the, the key. Our humility can be measured by our attitude toward others. Let me give you the second one here. Because a second point of measurement is, is this, that our humility is measured by our attitude toward life itself, how we view life itself. Verse 13 through 17 shows that. And, uh, and we saw earlier in this chapter where he was talking about self-indulgence and obtaining things for personal pleasures. That's what he was talking about in verses 3 and 4. Now he comes down here in verse 13, and he's talking about how, what's your worldview like? How do you... How do you consider what life is all about? He says, look here, uh, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year, we'll do business there, we'll make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to do is, uh, and say is if the Lord wants us to, then we'll live this way or that way. Otherwise, you're boasting about your, your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil, the word says. And then it says this in verse 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. So these verses give us a picture of how many people live their life in this self-indulgent, it's all about me. Krista, when you talked this morning in the midst of worship, worship puts us in a whole different place. Worship puts us in a place where our focus is completely on God and all the stuff that we carried. Think about it like, the things that were in your backpack when you came in here, the weights and burdens, the worries of things around you, the things that other people have said or the things that other people have done, the things of the questions and things you don't, you don't know the answers to, all of a sudden you just take that backpack and you drop it on the ground and all those things get scattered all across the floor. And now you stand here in the presence of the living God with your arms raised. I stand with arms raised high and heart abandoned to the one who gave it all, standing in awe to the one who gave it all. And, and when we do that, now the floor is covered with all the stuff that was the weights and burdens of the world around us, the world mindset that we had. And here's what I think actually happens next. Jesus, the humble servant, comes walking in with a broom and sweeps all that stuff into a pile and stands there as we worship him and he obliterates it all and it all disappears. And he says, the only thing that matters is your worship to me. That worship puts us in that place of humble submission before the Lord. That's the, that's the picture of where we need to get. Verse 10 told us to humble ourselves before the Lord and ultimately... That humility, submitting ourselves to God, don't take matters in your own hands. James points us, he's calling us to examine our lives in whether or not we're living a life that is submitted or surrendered toward the Lord. Examining our worldview and examining our attitude toward others. Where do we place ourselves in the midst of that? Our worldview, are we in control of everything that we do? Or do we demand control of everything that we do? Or is our worldview one that says, Lord, I, I want to do what you want me to do. Today, tomorrow, forever. 
our attitude toward others? Do we walk in superiority toward others or do we walk in submission to Jesus? Because the two things don't exist together. And forgive me for this, way too many Christians walk in superiority toward others because they feel they're living their life so much better than others. And it's completely opposed to what the word of God says. We don't walk in superiority to others. We walk in submission to Jesus. That's the key on that. So the paradox of humility is this. It's to improve the level of humility in our lives. We can't strive to be better at it. But instead, we further submit to God's plans and his purpose in how we live. And as a result of that submission, all pride and arrogance starts to fall away. So let me conclude this. And I, I want to conclude this with a, a story um, uh, uh, Jesus addresses, kind of an interesting uh, scenario. And he's addressing it about humility, um, but he never really brings the term up in here. It's, it's one of those cringeworthy situations that happens in the Bible in Jesus' ministry. And every time I read it, I find myself asking, did they really do that right there? I mean, did she really say that? Did that really just happen? And because it, it kind of makes me cringe. It, it makes me feel bad. Let me read this to you. Matthew chapter 20, starts in verse 20. It says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. You know what, where I'm about to go. Uh, she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. And he says, what's your request? And she replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and one on your left. Did she really do that? I mean, come on. What are James and John feeling right now? That have, they've got to be like shrinking into the corner right now. And all the other disciples are saying, is that your mommy up there that's asking about that? trying to get you a better position. Is that what's happening? But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? And they say, oh, yeah, 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 we're able. We're able. And he says, well, you're going to indeed drink from that bitter cup, but I want you to know I have no right to say who sits on my right or left. My father's prepared those places for the ones he's chosen. They jump in. They say, Lord, we can do it. We're going to suffer. If you're going to suffer, we're going to suffer. We're willing, which I really do think they meant. But I don't think they know what it meant. Because the whole question that's being asked here shows an incorrect understanding of God's kingdom. It was an expectation that a kingdom was going to be established like a worldly kingdom, where there would be those sitting on a throne ruling. And that when they see Jesus, they're going to see my son, James on one side and my son John on the other side. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're, you're missing what the kingdom is all about. They're saying, we'll work hard and do whatever it takes. But it wasn't about working and doing anything. Jesus shows them it was an issue of the heart that needed to be addressed because Jesus' kingdom is one that celebrates humility over pride and arrogance sitting on the right and the left and it celebrates humility. And Jesus called them together and he said, you know that the rulers of this world, they lord it over the people, the officials, they flaunt their authority over those under them. He says, but among you, it will be different. Say that with me, but among you, it will be different. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I think that's one of the coolest statements in the whole Bible. He said that the rulers they see in the world, great people they admire, they strive for their position. They strive for greatness. But in the kingdom, the kingdom requires humility. It's different. And among you, it will be different. He says, whoever wants to be the leader among you, he's gonna be, he must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you, he needs to become your slave. It says, even the son of man, now referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here's the picture of the true humility servanthood, sacrifice, surrender, submission. Jesus paints the picture that greatness comes from a life of submission. He makes the point that laying down your life and serving is the greatest picture of humility that could ever happen. And then he goes to prove it as he models what he did 
in laying down his life to pay the penalty for our sin. So why would we ever become proud or arrogant as though we're so great when the greatest human being that ever walked the earth, the son of God, son of man, determined to do it as a servant and lay aside all pride and arrogance and walk in humility. If we would learn to live in submission to him, that pride and arrogance will fall away and we'll walk in humility too. So the paradox of humility is that to achieve it, we need to surrender ourselves to God's authority and live a life of submission to him. So what's he been asking of you? Are there areas that he's been wanting you to surrender, to reconsider how you speak, what you say, things you do? Are there areas that you may need to bring underneath his authority? Things that you need to say, Lord, I've tried to do this on my own, but I need you. I need to bring it under your authority. Or is there something that you've been striving for that you might need to release into his hands? Say, Lord, I've been saying, I wanna do this but do you want me to do this? I want to release this into your hands now. Are there places you need to view the world differently? Because you have a view of the world that elevates you beyond the level that it ought to be, and you need to change your worldview. Or are there places where you need to view people differently? Because we end up not showing the same love and compassion for people that we, we ought to. You know, by the way, that was where Jesus ran into the, all the difficulties with the, with the Pharisees, that uh, he, the religious leaders that he ran to in, into in Scripture. It was the fact that they wanted to be elevated above the people, and he was coming to serve the people. That lowly position was one that was ultimately what produced humility, which is what it takes for success in God's kingdom. Let's love people more. Let's trust the Lord a little bit more. Amen? And let's submit ourselves to him. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, my friends who sit here today. Lord, all of us are on a journey where we're learning to be more like you. And as we read through the book of James, we realize James isn't here with a hammer saying, I'm doing this so good and you're doing it so bad. In fact, James is bringing us to the place of learning just the simple things, the simple tweaks that need to happen in our life they're gonna make life work better. So God, you resist the proud. Let us resist the devil and watch that pride and arrogance flee from us. You give grace to the humble. Let us place ourselves in submission to you and receive the grace that you have for us. I pray, Lord, that our lives would be a reflection of you in ways that maybe we've never, never realized. So do that for us, Lord, I pray. Keep your eyes closed for a second, your head's bowed. I just want to ask, maybe you're in this room, the most important point of submission you could ever come to is when you submit your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're joining with us online, and if that's the case, I'm going to invite you in just a moment to open your heart to Jesus. Maybe you never have, or maybe you have, and uh, and haven't been living that way, and it's an opportunity for you to come back. If you're online, I'm going to ask you to do something that, that uh, as I'm making this invitation to you, I'd like you to take and, and make a, a physical action. Reach out to whatever you're watching this on, your computer, your phone, your, your, your tablet or your TV, whatever it is, and, um, and, and just make some physical action reaching out. You're not, I can't see you do that, but Jesus can. And I'm gonna ask those in the room, if you're here and you're making a decision today, because I've gotta get my life into submission with Jesus. Maybe I've never done that before, or maybe I haven't, just haven't been living it out. I'd like to to ask you to do it this way. Everybody else's eyes are closed, heads are bowed, and they're praying for the Spirit of God to just begin moving in this room right now. And if you're here and you're saying, Pastor, pray for me because I want my life submitted to Jesus. I need to be the Lord of my life. Then I'm gonna ask you to do this. You look up at me, let our eyes meet. I wanna agree with you. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I wanna agree with you. And so I can see where your eyes are, are looking at me. Would you raise your hand? Uh, so I can see where you are. I agree with you today. Jesus becomes the Lord of your life. And I agree with you too, sir. And I agree with you right there. Jesus becomes the Lord of your life. And right here, right here. Are there others? I agree with you right there and right there. Today, Jesus becomes the Lord of your life. And you two sitting together right there, just tell each other, we're opening our hearts to Jesus today in submission to him. I see one, two, three hands back there in that section. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. 
Let Jesus come into your heart right there. I agree with you. I see you, ma'am. Today, Jesus is coming into your life. You two sitting right here. In fact, four of you in a row that are opening your heart to Jesus. I agree with you. Today, Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. He wants to take things that may have been broken in the past and make them whole in your future. Are there any others? Just wave at me if I haven't haven't seen you here online. If you're reaching out, yes, sir. I agree with you today. Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. Wants to change those areas of your heart, make you whole and pure in that area. Any, anyone else? I agree with you right there. I see you right there. So, Lord, for these right now that have opened their heart to Jesus, that are making that commitment. Oh, I see two more hands, three hands in the back. Forgive me. Thanks for waiting for me. I know Jesus has been waiting for you. God bless you. Lord, for these that are making those decisions right now, I would ask, Lord God, that just as that hand has been raised as a point of of saying, I want to turn from where I've been and place my life in submission to Jesus now, I pray, Lord God, that you come in and you bring forgiveness of all the sins and things that have been Uh, been in the way in the areas, Lord, that even you have resisted. I pray, Lord, that those would be gone. And now, Lord, your grace would be poured over each of these right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Praise God.